This episode is sponsored by Victory Grips. Victory Grips are the standard in hand protection, plus they just launched their new gym affiliate program. As affiliate owners, they understand the demands of gym owners. Their goal is to keep their gym referral program process as simple as possible. You'll receive educational content, early access to upcoming releases, and exclusive discounts for your members, plus received a percentage of the net sales. Find out more at victorygrips.com. Welcome to the Power Monkey Podcast, where we chat with the best in the world about what they do. I'm your host, Dave Durante, with my two co-hosts this week. One, Mr. Chad Vaughn, of course, with me as often as he can be. And we have Mr. Chris Hinshaw, the owner and founder of Aerobic Capacity, back with us again. We're not interviewing Chris this time. We are more talking about a project that the three of us have been working on for a number of years. We're very proud of it. COVID kind of made us take a little bit of a backseat in terms of bringing it and exposing it to more and more people. But... We're really excited to be able to talk about Capacity Wad. And what Capacity Wad is essentially taking some of the tenants from the endurance world that Chris has been utilizing with his athletes in terms of running and swimming and cycling and all those great endurance sports and applying it to skill-specific training. How do we build some stamina? How do we build endurance around skill-specific training? It's a very interesting topic. It's something that we're proud to be able to unveil more and more with people. We'll go into a little bit of some of the science and some of the topics around how this program can potentially benefit you and your athletes, and we hope you enjoy it. All right, everybody, all listeners out there, we have a special episode today. We have uh, incredible guests. We have actually my co-host, Chad Vaughn, but we have another special guest who's been on a few times with us. We're going to be talking about a special program that we've been working on together for a number of years now, and we want more people to understand how incredible this can be for their training. Mr. Chris Hinshaw, owner, founder of Aerobic Capacity, as our third guest. Chris, how are you doing today, buddy? I'm great. Yeah, no, I always uh, I enjoy our get-togethers. Every time I I leave a call with both you and Chad, I, I, I'm all fired up. That's a, yeah. So, yeah, I'm excited about the fuse you guys are about to light. <laughs> well, I think all of us are. And, you know, the, the concept for what we're going to be talking about was kind of your brainchild in terms of, how it all came about. Uh, we're talking, of course, about uh, Capacity Wad, something that uh, the three of us have been working on together for a couple of years. And pandemic kind of, uh, we had, we went on a, a little tour doing some courses right before the pandemic. We were on the East Coast. We did some in New York, New Jersey. And then pandemic hit, and it kind of like took the winds out of the sails a little bit in terms of some momentum that we have been building. But I want to give the listeners a little bit of the background in terms of how this was was kind of uh, structured, the idea behind it. Chris, can you give a little bit of a background in terms of um, how this brainchild all, all came together? Yeah, I mean, as an endurance coach, I've always been fascinated by work capacity and how to improve work capacity. And just so we're clear, um, work capacity, what it's referring to is the general ability of the body to produce more work um, at different intensities, or it could be for duration. And so I was always interested in these, these concepts and in the endurance world, what we do is, is we always combine different intensities together. Uh, and that includes recovery. Uh, we know of recovery as passive recovery and active recovery. So passive recovery is when you, you sit around and do nothing. Um, we sit around typically for you know, when we do nothing for the purpose where the focus is the intensity, right? The speed, if it's it's in an endurance movement such as running or rowing, but if it's weightlifting, then it would be the load that you're lifting. Um, and then the same thing, we also are targeting duration. So when we sit around and have passive recoveries, we're really not focused on improvement of recovery. We're interested in using the recovery to put us in a better position for the next interval. That's the purpose of rest. But as we know, if you're always sitting around and doing nothing in your recovery with good nutrition, right, you get good at doing nothing. And that's the problem. And so in the endurance world, we combine active recovery and active recovery. I know a lot of people consider it to be an hour long row in CrossFit, but uh, you talk to a rower, that would be a workout. Same thing if you went to you know, a lake and swam a mile, I'd consider that as a swimmer to be a, a workout. Active recovery is where you take a movement that creates fatigue. Uh, think of a, a running sprint, like a 100-meter sprint, 
And then the active recovery is, is a movement that mimics that fatigue generating movement, such as the running sprint, but it follows up with a movement for the intent of recovery. And so in this case, you could follow up that running sprint with a walk, or you could follow up that running sprint with a very, very slow recovery jog. But the purpose, the purpose is to clear fatigue in the muscle groups that you just created fatigue in. And so there's intent behind it. The real question is, how fast can you move during your recovery and still be able to clear fatigue? How fast is that? And that was really my quest um, by focusing on endurance, but just don't give the athlete more and more running volume, more rowing volume. Essentially what I'm gonna do is build capacity by manipulating the recovery. And that's what started this concept. And and so obviously this has been a tool that <clears throat> you in the endurance world have been using forever as ways to improve your your output. But nothing like this has ever really been put together for skill development. And there's been no reason why weightlifters or gymnastics um, experts have ever had a necessity for creating capacity around skill specific development before CrossFit was around. Like, you know, one of the questions that we would get, I'm sure Chad gets a similar question, but like, a uh, question around like how how many muscle ups can you do in a row to to me or like what's your 30 <laughs> muscle up for time and my answer would always be like i have no idea like why would a gymnast ever need to know that answer and crossfit has exposed this this niche within um fitness training that us as experts in gymnastics and weightlifting have never needed to even know the answer to so th this idea that you put forward chris was very intriguing to both uh chad and i because it was a new way for us to implement something from your world into our world in a completely new way. And, you know, we had yeah. so many athletes that were interested in this. It was like, you know, we don't know the answer, but let's go find out. Let's go find out exactly how it works. I think what's fascinating is when I get the chance to talk to you guys. And so I, I, I come up with a lot of different ideas. And, and one of the, the areas for me that's an incredible opportunity is to sit with, you know, you, Chad, and, and you, Dave, and, and just bounce off ideas. And, you know, when we were in, in Brazil, Chad, um, to be able to co-coach together and to just bounce ideas off the day, it, it, it gave a chance for some of these things to settle. And, you know, for the people that are listening, CrossFit it created a sport where you're, you're doing gymnastic skill work along with weightlifting work. But what they did is they did something unique. They made the weightlifter aware that you're going to potentially have a workout that has 90 repetitions of weightlifting movement. And that changes the whole way in which a weightlifter has to think about training. They're not training for maximal strength or maximal power output. They're training for capacity. They're training for volume. They're training muscular endurance. And I'm not talking about a 20 rep, which is a big number for a weightlifter. It's not uncommon where we would see a weightlifting workout where there would be 150 repetitions. And so how are you going to handle that additional capacity requirement by just doing one to five rep max lifts? And that created the predicament. And what's cool is you talk to a Chad Vaughn and you outline that predicament. What is interesting in the way in which he understood it, and Chad, I'll tell you what you said on that day. I remember it. You know, Chris, in weightlifting, people lose competitions because they can't recover prior to going out to the platform. It's interesting that when Chad heard this concept, he immediately equated to it as an athlete in Olympic weight training. The same thing with you, Dave, of like, wow, it is interesting, this concept, but why isn't it done on the national level in both gymnastics and in weightlifting? And it's because the merits of your sport don't require it, right? They don't. In, in, in a, a one rep lift, you don't. But it does matter if all of a sudden the two people in front of you on that weightlifting platform pass, and now all of a sudden your 10 minutes of rest went down to two minutes of rest. Now, all of a sudden it does matter. 
And so if we're thinking about in this age, which let's face it, the three of us are perfectionists, then aren't we missing out on an opportunity even at the highest level to create perfection by looking at recovery as a quality within a workout that must be considered at the same level of importance as volume as in the intensity. Uh, absolutely. And and so probably for a weightlifter, uh, specifically trying to compete in the Olympics or at the highest level, could they use capacity wide in some way in their training? Yes, absolutely. They could. Am I suggesting that they do so? It's kind of up to them. You know, that's not really our market. What we're trying to do is, is get to the CrossFitter specifically that has these more specific demands and things that they want to do. Um, but absolutely, uh, you know, I use capacity wad on a regular basis in my training just because I'm a part of it, you know, but I've experimented with it a lot. And, and I think there's value there for the weightlifter. Absolutely. Even though it's not specifically created for the weightlifter, can gymnast use capacity wad? Absolutely. And I think Dave sees that more so as an opportunity to develop skills. And I can see that side of it too. in weightlifting, if, if you're going to do, you know, um, 50 reps within our five minute workouts, uh, in the recovery section. And I, again, I'm just picking a kind of a average or small number there that there would be with say a, a muscle snatch or a hip power snatch in the recovery section, then you're accumulating a lot of reps that could value your, uh, technique, something that maybe you're trying to change in your technique or improve on could be drilled within those sections. But I want to take a just a little bit of a sidestep here and talk about the program that we have to offer because I'm excited to get it out there as well. And I think just explaining that uh, briefly and even reading through some of the stuff that we have as a description on Sugar Wad, where the program is, will help explain a little bit more where we're coming from and also lead us into uh, the few different variations of the workouts that we have. And so, yes, we are on Sugar Wad. You can find it there on the marketplace. Uh, but also we'll uh, give you a direct link to that uh, in the show notes also. But these are five-minute workouts that, that are delivered on a daily basis. And yeah, you can do them on a daily basis. You can do multiple of these uh, per day if you kind of want to get all of those in. There's different ways that you can incorporate it into your training that we can talk a little bit more about later. But uh, And again, just taking this directly from the site, the aim of Capacity Watt is to build your capacity and therefore increase the energy you have to perform your workouts with more effectiveness and intensity. Capacity Watt will provide daily workouts that can be incorporated into any day's training. The workouts will be intended to build capacity by improving your ability to recover through five-minute EMOMs that will incorporate short bursts of maximal effort fun functional movement followed by slower and less intense movement of the same pattern with the purpose of clearing fatigue. Workouts will be labeled with either a C- meaning clearance workout, or a T, meaning tolerance workout. Each will have a specific skill focus and will be random daily. These five-round workouts can easily fit into a daily training, and we recommend using them as a fun and beneficial finisher. Now, just to give a quick example of these five-minute EMOMs and talking about being intense and then doing something that is active recovery, uh, a, a number of different ways that, that we describe this and look at this is build fatigue and then clear fatigue or high intensity into low intensity, anaerobic, aerobic, fast twitch, slow twitch, high force, low, low force, muscle lactate, muscle recovery, speed, endurance, building fatigue and then clearing fatigue. If you think about, again, I'm just going to use weightlifting because uh, I'm the weightlifter here. If we do uh, a short burst of snatches from the floor as fast as we can, uh, power snatches from the floor as fast as we can, touch and go the way that you would do in CrossFit. Typically, we would uh, uh, make you do that for 12 seconds. And, and Chris, will have you talk about why 12 seconds here in a little bit. But we would have you do that for 12 seconds, 12 seconds as fast as you can. We'll give you a minimum number that we want you to be able to reach on each of those five rounds in the five-minute EMOM. But for the remainder of that minute, for 48 seconds, we're going to have you do something like a muscle snatch from the hip or a power snatch from the hip or the knee or even mimicking from the ground, but only with a PVC pipe. So you're going through that same movement. You're using the same patterns. You're using the same muscles. 
uh, with this very light PVC pipe to help clear fatigue, to help you go into the next minute. And if you're not able to move continuously, if it's each minute gets harder for you, which it's going to get a little bit harder, but there, it says a lot about where you're at in your ability to recover. If you're not able to recover very much or very, very well at all in the remainder of each of those minutes while you're moving that PVC pipe, then capacity wide, certainly doing that on a regular basis is going to help you increase your ability to recover. And that example that I just gave is an example of a clearance workout. It's the most common uh, workout probably probably that we do. Again, typically that's pushing for 12 minutes and then and then uh, doing active recovery for uh, the remainder of the minute, 48 seconds. The tolerance workouts uh, are a little bit different. And um, Chris, do you want to go into to what those are? Sure. So like Chad mentioned, we have the two major categories, the clearance and the tolerance. Uh, the clearance focuses on the recovery. The tolerance focuses on the intensity. And so <clears throat> what we can easily do is we can consider a tolerance workout something similar to what would you would experience if you did a short hill sprint workout. Imagine you're going to run, let's say, 20 seconds up a hill um, and you're fresh. You're going to sprint that 20 seconds. At the top of that hill, you're going to experience fatigue. And one of the sources of fatigue at these increasing intensities is that the oxygen that your aerobic system utilizes for energy, it becomes inadequate to meet the needs, the metabolic needs of the muscles as you're doing that sprint. So what you do is you get supplemental energy anaerobically. Anaerobically literally means without oxygen. So you're getting actual energy to the muscles to help them contract without ox oxygen. And as a byproduct of using this anaerobic energy, we produce what we know as lactic acid. Now, quickly after this lactic acid comes into the body, it dissociates into a lactate part and an acidity part. And one of the things that we do is we're able to measure this lactate. And we know when this lactate is present, the acidity is also present. Now, the fatigue is coming from the acidity. If we don't get rid of this acidity, then it's going to build up in our bodies. If it keeps building, ultimately this acidity will interfere with the muscle's ability to function. Essentially, if you don't slow down, the acidity is going to force you to slow down. It's the body's way of self-correcting itself for bad choices that an athlete makes when it comes to their intensity as well as their recovery. And so when we're doing these pill sprints, the first interval, we accumulate this lactic acid and this acidity is going to be present in our muscles when we start our second interval because we're just going to walk down to the bottom and do number two so essentially you're starting number two and more fatigue than you did on number one same thing holds true on number three essentially what we are doing is denying sufficient recovery time for your body to clear that acidity now, there's a couple of ways in which this body can actually clear it. One, you can do it with your heart. Your heart will consume that lactate as a fuel, and when it does, it will take the acidity and remove it from the body. Same thing with the liver and the brain. But the primary, the primary consumption of that lactate is the muscles. So the muscles, when they consume that lactate as a fuel to help them contract, what it will do is take the fatigue causing metabolites, that acidity, and also remove it from the body. The problem in the tolerance workout is you're denied a sufficient amount of rest in order to clear that acidity out. So that's why you start with a very minimal amount of acidity. And by the time you get to your final round, it is a almost lethal do dose of acidity where your body is now shutting down. Your task in a tolerance workout is resist the urge to quit. As a byproduct of resisting the urge and forcing the body to stay turned on and moving while doing those hill sprints, your body secretes an enzyme, sodium bicarbonate is one of them, that it helps to buffer or neutralize that accumulating acidity. Essentially, it counteracts that accumulation of acidity 
by you bringing these very, very high doses and forcing the muscles to function. So if we're talking about having capacity, we have to have the capacity to keep the muscles turned on, to keep moving under this high amount of acidity. This is a very trainable adaptation at equal importance to what can be done in a lactate clearance workout where the focus isn't the intensity, it's on the removal of that acidity at the fastest possible rate. Can I add something yeah. really quickly to that? Yeah. Uh, just on the tolerance side, Chris, yeah, um, the thoughts on, you know, if you're doing one of our tolerance workouts, one of the components that you might see often is not just this intensity into the recovery component, but there's a lot of pause work, a lot of isometric component that we've added in as a mm -hmm. third side where, you know, we talk about creating fatigue and then clearing fatigue. But when you're adding the the pause component, it does not allow that muscle group to uh, allow the fatigue to get consumed by other muscle groups. It's not allowing it to move. So we force that muscle group to stay turned on. It keeps the lactate within that muscle group specifically, which means that by round two and round three and beyond, we're intentionally making it more challenging by adding in that static hold component. Can you factor that in a little bit in terms of how that changes the dynamic of that type of a workout? So what we're really trying to do is, is look at different options to force the muscles to endure that accumulation of acidity for a longer amount of time. So incorporating in these isometric holds, these eccentric movements where we're pausing or slowing the recovery to force the muscles to stay active under these high doses of acidity. That's the primary goal. And so <clears throat> if we look at it in terms of a movement, take, for example, you wanted to get better in a rope climb. And in a rope climb, there is a tolerance requirement, meaning you're going to have to learn how to keep the muscles firing under this high force type of activity of climbing the rope, especially if it's legless. So how in training can you get someone to put in more time climbing a rope when they won't have the capacity to climb it for more than one repetition? The way we do it is we do a climb and then before we touch the ground, we go in an isometric hold with the weak pole arm on top. And now there are no muscles being used we're completely in contraction, holding this pose. And it is a way for us to extend the length of time that these muscles are holding that accumulation of fatigue. Let's say you hold for 15 seconds, you now come down, and now you could start an active recovery. What would be a good active recovery for a rope climb? How about a skier, something nice and slow? That would be your recovery. And then you repeat that process again. The question is, how fast can you ski erg and still be able to recover and get up that rope for the second round? And you can play around with that component of it. Now, this is, this is where it's, I think when we started doing these workouts and putting together, it got really exciting for us, right? Uh, tell listeners out there when we went down to Orlando, the first time that we started building these workouts, we went to um, Cassidy Lance McWhorter's gym and we were like, Cassidy, we're going to put you through the ringer today. And we <laughs> had this enormous whiteboard with, I don't even know how many movement patterns and potential combinations and potential recovery exercises. And we started just playing around with what might work well together. And what's very cool here is that, you know, you mentioned ski erg as a potential recovery for that rope climb workout, but the, the cool part, the, the artistic side of these workouts is that you can come up with so many different ways to be working on uh, a recovery component or the uh, or increasing the intensity according to what you want to get out of the workout. And that's what I love about putting these workouts together. You think about a muscle-up, right? We think about a capacity workout for a muscle-up. You can have someone do muscle-ups for this short period of time to kind of build that fatigue. And then depending on where the deficiency is, you can add the recovery component there. So is your pull deficient? Is your push deficient? Is your grip deficient? So wherever someone is really struggling within their movement pattern, you can create that path around that recovery so that they're getting maximum benefit in terms of building capacity around their weakness. 
So it's a very cool way to be thinking about what's my weakness, make it more individualized, and I can create a, a workout that's specifically targeted to you around where your individual weakness is. I love this idea, and it's allowed us to create thousands of workouts that are all unique around individual weaknesses. Yeah, yeah, Dave, that really, I mean, just listening to you guys talking and every time we get together and talk about this, it just always brings my mind back to the the technicians that we all are. We're, we're all, I think, um, at the heart of what we are and what we do as teachers. Are, is, it's all about technique. I mean, that's, you know, the power monkey slogan, technique matters. And that's all we're always trying to accomplish. And so when I first under, was understanding these workouts more, and started putting some of them together, I saw that golden opportunity to um, for athletes to be able to work on technique, whether it's a clearance workout, but especially if it's a tolerance workout, talking about putting holds in the middle of these five-minute EMOMs and being able to choose where those are, for example, doing a, a, a snatch workout or a, a deadlift workout, a clean deadlift workout specifically is, is one that we have that, that comes to mind, uh, very, very vividly, but it's making athletes pause at the above knee position or even pause in the standing position and getting them to relax instead of being tense and everything else. But having them pause in key positions is absolutely one about the fatigue part of it and limiting the amount of recovery they have. But the other part of that for me is sneaking in technique work. If they can get better and more familiar with this key position that I'm making them hold in, they're going to move through their low low weight, high rep efforts in CrossFit better over time. And they're going to be able to hit better positions and have better technique uh, when they're trying to lift heavy outside of this concept and out, outside of uh, CrossFit. Tolerance versus clearance, I want to come back to that for a second and just give an example of, well, one, say that each of these types of workouts, they're going to help everyone, and that's why we have a good combination of them in the program, but if you're, one other way to look at it is the types of athletes that are going to benefit most from a tolerance workout, for example, is going to be an athlete like Chris. Chris is an endurance athlete. He's been doing that his entire life. So he doesn't really need to work on recovering better as much as he needs to work on the the strength or in the intensity part of it. Me, on the other hand, if I really want to get better in CrossFit and be able to recover better within my uh, CrossFit workouts, then I need to be doing more clearance workouts where I'm spending the majority of that minute learning how to uh, recover better. But Coming back to the tolerance part of that, Dave, I'd love for you to give an example of a gymnastics workout that you give that is tolerance. I think there's one that you do on a regular basis uh, that I love watching you take people through. So there, there's there's a few. Uh, they're all miserable. So just kind of get that out of the way really quickly. Um, but there's a, a core one that I think um, people can really gravitate towards in terms of uh, how it can benefit. And this one came about because of uh, something that Chris had kind of passed along in terms of a weakness that uh, Frazier had had back in the day with some hip flexor work. And so uh, we put together a tolerance workout around hip flexors. And we we normally, when we're teaching our, you know, our course around this and uh, telling people about it, this is one of the core ones that we like throwing out there. And it has to do with some variation of either a tuck up or a V up. Most of the time, people have to start with a tuck up just because of the challenge of doing it with straight legs. But we'll end doing, say, 15 seconds of V ups and or tuck ups as quickly as possible, really working on that compression movement. Then from there, you're going to do another 15 seconds of that isometric hold in either a tuck hold or a hollow hold. If you're doing a hollow hold, you're at a pretty high level. It's very, very difficult to maintain a full hollow hold. And then for the remaining 30 seconds, you would do a slow leg raise or a slow knee to chest to help with that clearance of the fatigue as best you possibly can. Five rounds of that, that isometric hold right in the middle makes this thing enormously challenging. And I, I, I for those who maybe uh, have the video here, I'm putting recovery in quotes because the recovery mm -hmm. is not really a, the easy side of this workout. Uh, becomes extraordinarily challenging. But that particular workout is one of the hardest that we've seen do. 
uh, have done, but I love that workout. I love the importance of putting the emphasis on core and specifically weak hip flexors, but that one's a good one to test out five rounds, 15, 15, 30 with either a tuck or a via variation. Yeah, that, that one's one. Let's put this in quotes again, that, that I love, uh, when we did our little clinics together, uh, for capacity wide, one of the things that we all did is when Dave was teaching, then Chris and I would jump into the workout and then, uh, we would have that, those different combinations. And, um, I was kind of trying to get out of it one time and Chris was like, no, get over here. We, we got to do this. So, but, I have to say that yeah. Chris is always the first one to jump into the workout. Yeah. Chris will yeah. always <laughs> do the workout. It's awesome to see it. Chris like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. I, I, I'm like, we end up doing like 10 of these capacity workouts per se. And Chris is always the first one to jump in. I love that. I, I was like, damn it, Chris, just calm down. Just let's just set this one up. I know we, we had to, we had to do it, but um, I want to jump back to you, Chris, and uh, I want you to talk about the example. You always tell a lot of stories, but the story that you told me when we were there in Brazil and what really made this concept come together and make sense to me is you told me a story about, again, Matt Frazier, where we've been, we'll just use him as an example all day, I guess, why not, uh, about a D-ball workout that you gave him and this goal that he had with 150-pound D-ball for and what you had to do is create a clearance workout for him to uh, get better at that. Yeah. So the the goal was, and and that's what's what's interesting is that when an athlete will come to a coach with a particular goal, it's the coach's job to assess the athlete's strengths and weaknesses. I mean, what's preventing them? What's the roadblock preventing them from reaching that goal? And um, that's where a coach has to come in and, and help find that solution. And the goal was to be able to do 25 heavy D balls unbroken, um, essentially a sprint. Well, when the question comes down, okay, so what's preventing that from occurring? Well, this is where we have to come in and help. And the answer is usually it's one of two things. Do you need more speed, more intensity, more power output, more strength? Is that what's preventing you from reaching your goal? Or is it your stamina? You lack the ability to endure from a muscular standpoint. Do you feel like it's just accumulation of fatigue, meaning your inability to recover, which recovery is a major measure of aerobic fitness? Which of those two things is your issue? And in this case, it wasn't strength. It was, I just get tired. So when you have an athlete <clears throat> that shares with you, they just get tired, then that's what we should fix. Fix their inability to recover. Fix that recovery side of the equation. And that's what we did. So the workout, very straightforward, simple, was a very heavy 150 pound D ball, three repetitions, or up to around seven seconds for him. Um, and these were fast movements. So he would probably get in about three of them. Then there would be one minute of recovery. And what the recovery had to be is a movement pattern that was similar to the one that just created fatigue. Like we mentioned, running sprint, what's similar to a sprint in running? A walk. So what could we do? The movement we picked was a one minute med ball, 20 pounds, ground to shoulder. So mimicking the same movement pattern, but changing the intensity from a create fatigue intensity to a recovery, clear fatigue intensity. And so it was three repetitions at 150 pounds into one minute with 20 pounds, nice and slow, five rounds. So instead of typically doing a workout, which involved repetitions at 150 pounds and then sitting around and doing nothing for recovery, we got him to move for over six minutes, but we disguised five of those minutes as recovery. And that, if you don't know, that's how you build stamina, by building it through the recovery. Now, now one of the other things that we kind of um, mentioned, but I think a little bit further explanation would be helpful is the duration of time for the intensity component. You know, uh, Chad, you mentioned mm -hmm potentially 12 seconds, 15 seconds, upwards of 20 mm -hmm. seconds. There, there's a purpose behind that as well. Chris, can you mention in terms of why we try to um, not 
go over 20 seconds when it comes to the, the, the initial intensity component of these workouts, you know, people are thinking, okay, how do I make these harder? Can I do the intensity for five minutes and then go into recovery? Why do we try to have 20 as kind of the cap when it comes to that initial side of things? So there are a few rules and this is a big one. Um, remember the, the purpose of the intensity side is, is to, to generate force. It has to be high intensity and no one is capable of maintaining maximum velocity for over 30 seconds when they're fresh. In our community, the longest I've ever seen is 26 seconds. And so 30 seconds, it's an, unknown, it's, it's an unheard of ask. Now why? That's because when an athlete is fresh, they have three sources of energy. That phosphagen system is the first source of energy that allows that athlete to move. That phosphagen burns cleanly and it delivers a maximal amount of energy output, all right? It produces the greatest energy. And so when we're doing a 10 second splint, sprint or one rep lift, we're using this phosphagen. The problem with this phosphagen is it only lasts for about 10 seconds. So what's behind it that allows us to move next? That's our anaerobic energy. And that's what we're chasing in these workouts. We want that anaerobic energy because we want those fatigue causing metabolites to enter the muscles that we're using in that movement. After we have 30 seconds, we start seeing a increased contribution aerobically and that is not the purpose of our intensity. We don't want aerobic contribution because as soon as that occurs, there's a risk of recruiting slow twitch recovery fibers and those fibers should not kick in until they get to the recovery within these workouts. So the rule of thumb is if we're gonna maximize the production of, of energy anaerobically, then after our first interval, when there's no more phosphagen energy left, if we limit the total volume to 20 seconds, it will be 100% anaerobic on the condition that the athlete can maintain motivation for that 20 second time period, which is impossible. Think about if you had to do five intervals on the track and each interval was a lap around that track. So you're doing five laps. You're gonna do a hundred meter sprint and then a 300 jog. There's your workout, five rounds, 100 sprint, 300 jog, five rounds. You have to maintain your hundred meter sprint time. Well, that's a reasonable ask, but what if you had to sprint for 200 meters? Could you maintain that? And the answer is no. You cannot. So the athlete's motivation also matters. And so people ask, why 12 seconds? Because you know what? 13 was too long and 11 wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. And that's why. But the rule is athlete motivation is number one. They have to maintain the targeted intensity. Number two is it's never going to be longer than 20 seconds. So if you want to program based upon repetitions, you can but you got to make sure rules one and two are followed. Yeah. Chad had mentioned some recommendations around rep schemes, but it's more about the intensity associated with that first component. And the, the, the rep is more from trial and error on our part saying, mm -hmm. you know, we've been able to maintain these numbers with high intensity. This is a target to shoot for, as opposed to saying that we, we, absolutely need this number it's more about the intensity needed within that time domain rather than hitting a particular number right and and on the tolerance side of that so we're speaking mostly in terms of clearance with talking about 12 seconds but in terms of the tolerance workouts we're usually going to give a certain number of reps that we want you to do before we incorporate a, a hold or something like that uh, one example of the clean deadlift workout that that this is probably my probably my favorite uh, tolerance workout. It is I think it's four touch and go clean deadlifts, then hold for eight seconds in the standing position, hold for eight seconds in the above knee position on the way down, and then do four more touch and go reps. Put the put the bar down, and then you'll do a, a um, just with your body weight, bend over and touch the bar, and then stand back up and touch your hips with your hands, just so you're going through that same motion. But we indicate that you need to be using a weight and we have a recommended weight, but you need to be using a weight that will allow you to get through those four reps in a certain amount of time. If it starts to go over that, 
within any portion of that workout, then you have too much weight on the bar. So we have these uh, time frame sprints for clearance, and then we typically have a certain number of reps that we want you to hit in no more than a certain amount of time within the uh, the tolerance workouts. But yeah, you know, once again, guys, so excited to talk about capacity wide. It's it's something that we have created and we have so many workouts uh there on sugar wide ready to go for athletes to benefit from and that i know that they'll benefit from and it's just you know with the the pandemic and all the other stuff that we're working on something that's just a little bit been sitting there and and i'm excited to talk about it and get more information out out to folks and and let them know and hopefully get them to try uh, a little bit of this out and before we head towards getting off here i think we should talk about how athletes can incorporate this into their training, because this is not a complete program. It's meant to be, you know, um, uh, and it's some assistance work for your program and and for your ability, really specifically within CrossFit. Again, I use it for myself, um, even when I'm training for a, a weightlifting competition, just for, you know, quote unquote, active recovery and a way to finish out my workout. So if I'm doing heavy squats, on any given day, then I want to flush my body and flush my legs at the end of that workout by doing a very quick and meaningful five minute capacity wad workout. And that's, I think the key recommendation that we would have for where you should use these in whatever type of workout that you're doing. If you're doing CrossFit class, or if you're on a competitive CrossFit program, throw these in at the end of each of your workouts. And you don't even have to be, in my opinion, especially if you're doing the general plan, You don't even have to be choosy about which ones you do. Just get them in as you're able to. So it doesn't matter what you've done in your workout, whatever capacity wide workout comes up for that day, just do that at the end of that day and then go from there. Again, if you don't work out seven days a week, which I hope most of you don't, then you can do, you know, two of these in a day on some days to make sure that you get seven in per week. And you can absolutely do two at the end of your workout instead of just one on some of those days. Another way that I use them personally, because You know, even again, when I'm training for a weightlifting competition, I am now at the point to where I'm working out at the most for 45 minutes to an hour. And if I feel like I need to move on one of my off days, capacity wide is a great option for me to go in and literally get, you know, a kick ass workout done, something that is hard for me and and gets me moving in 10 minutes and 10 minutes means that I can do just a very quick general warm up. Uh, I can take the few minutes to set up and then I can be done with that capacity wad workout in five minutes on some other days. If I have a little bit more time, I may combine my normal, um, mobility sequence that I do for weightlifting. So I'm, you know, I spend about 10 or 15 minutes there and then I can jump right into that five minute capacity wide, whatever that is and get that done. And so I'm done in, you know, 20 to 30 minutes uh, at the very most. And I've got gotten a tremendous amount of good quality reps and, and conditioning work in as well there. Um, again, on your off days, active recovery, if, if you're using them on, on your off days, feel free to do one of those or two of those to, to get them in, but also just to give your body that opportunity to move around and stuff like that in combination with other plans that you may need as well. Um, and again, an, an example of that is on the days that I, well, on when I'm getting back into a weightlifting program, when I'm just, I don't have really much of a purpose for training other than trying to stay healthy. That is, I'll either just be doing my, my mobility stuff for weightlifting purposes and capacity wide. And that's basically all I'm doing for a certain number of weeks. I think I've done that for up to a month, but I've also done capacity wide in combination with just a strength cycle, meaning that I'm not, I'm not doing any snatches or clean and jerks unless they're in a capacity wide workout. So I may be doing a squat and deadlift and pressing program. So I'm basically just squatting um, on day one and day three, and then a capacity wad after each of those. And then day two, maybe I'm uh, deadlifting and pressing. And and then again, a quick capacity wad workout after that. So those are my takes on how I use it and how I would recommend athletes use it as well. I'm right there with you. I think you said it all, Chad. Beautiful. Chris, uh, before we get off here, do you have any any parting words for the listeners? If I was contemplating capacity wad, 
what I would be thinking about is how is this going to benefit me? And we all talk about athlete ownership. We all do. And the problem with athlete ownership is that athletes just don't have a, a very deep understanding of their strengths and weaknesses. This program, it will help you identify in every movement, what is your strength and your weakness? Is what's preventing you from doing more work, your inability to tolerate fatigue? Do you, is that really your issue? That your definition of intensity truly is an intensity. And that needs to be redefined based upon how good you are as an athlete. Or is your limitation you just get tired? What if you just didn't accumulate so much fatigue while doing handstand push-ups? Could you do more? What if you didn't accumulate so much fatigue while doing push-ups during MRF? Could you do more? And so this is where athletes have to be able to build their base of knowledge to be able to communicate to a coach what's preventing me from reaching my goals. This program will help define in movement, is your limitation intensity or is it recovery? Absolutely, absolutely. I love it, guys. I'm Again, I'm so excited that we got together and talked about this and I'm sure there's no way we're not gonna get back on uh, a few more recordings to talk about more specific parts of a capacity wide and maybe bring in some some guests and, and stuff like that, some ideas I know that we have floating around that I'm excited about that I won't mention just yet. But to the listeners out there, we very much appreciate you guys listening in. If you have any questions on Capacity Wide, uh, feel free to reach out. Definitely head over to Sugar Wide Marketplace uh, to learn more or to get started with Capacity Wide. And we'll add that direct link into the, sh the, into the show notes, as mentioned earlier. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, also at Capacity Wide. We do have an Instagram page there that you can follow along with and sample workouts and stuff like that that you can do. Um, and individually for and individually and for our other services at Hinshaw 363, at Aerobic Capacity, uh -huh. at Dave Durante, at Power Monkey Fitness, at Ollie Chad, and at Barbell Mobility. On behalf of, of Capacity Wide, I'm Chad Vaughn with Chris Hinshaw and Dave Durante. And until next time, guys, thank you all for listening.